afternoon and pleasure to be here. I think it's uh, fantastic that all of you are doing the first uh, physical kind of program that all of us have seen in a while. So great to be here and good luck. And I think the focus on the intellectual South is definitely well appreciated. Uh, there is no doubt that all of us as a country need to move and we do have the potential to achieve this aspirational five trillion. So I think uh, the recent estimates that we will see in 21-22, a growth rate of upward of 11%, set the country itself uh, to arguably be among the world's fastest growing economy. But what do we need for the southern states? So I would first say uh, the most important is really to focus on infrastructure. Because infrastructure is the single sector which can take about 200 sectors along with it. The second one is to continue our pace on digital and to build uh, digitally inclusive societies, digitally pervasive environments, which enable everyone to move where the rest of the world is moving. I believe that when we talk sector by sector, there is great potential, but manufacturing really calls itself out because of the potential of you know, the redefined uh, global supply chains, resilient global supply chains that people are talking about. So this is a great opportunity and government policy is matching the global opportunity. The moment is now for uh, South India and I think Chennai has always been, or uh, Tamil Nadu has always been one of the manufacturing hubs, Karnataka, uh, Andhra, Telangana all catching up. So manufacturing is clearly one of the big ones uh, that we, we definitely must focus on. Uh, I must add, most appropriately, I think, is that we should also strive to be an inclusive, environmentally friendly, socially aware type of state or country. Because tomorrow's consumer is a lot more discerning than just what's the product, what's the price. They are looking at the background of where this is coming from. So I think evolved organizations, if they can emerge from the South, from India, they will set global benchmarks which will set us as a country on the right track. So uh, execution of the NIP, big one, uh, education and skilling, manufacturing focus, of course agri and ability to implement what is being planned in agri, um, inclusive like I said and the right quality of the organization and finally Healthcare does have the potential to do, whether it's pharma or medical services or making India, uh, Chennai, uh, a global hub for medical tourism. IT did something fantastic for the country in the last decade. This decade, healthcare could replicate that for the country. Right. Well, I think if uh, India reaches the five trillion mark, uh, whichever year it is, I would imagine that South will not be just uh, one trillion because even now uh, the Southern states uh, together contribute uh, close to 25 to 27 percent. So it ought to be much higher and it can surely be much higher if that happens. Uh, I endorse all that uh, Sangeeta has said, but let me uh, make three points which are perhaps at a slightly uh, higher level. One is that I'm not sure that we ought to be looking at uh, South as being uh, a separate engine of growth as compared to the rest of the country. I think yeah. the, we need to really look at uh, holistically for the entire country to move forward. Southern states have certain, uh, certain advantages, certain uh, strengths. Uh, Eastern states and Western states have other strengths, but I think we need to look at something that encompasses the entire country, not uh, have a southern strategy for a trillion dollar. I think it must, there must be a cadence of a five trillion dollar strategy. The cadence comes down in several forms to different parts of the country. The second is that I think we have some comparative uh, advantages. Uh, you talked about the IT, uh, the strength of IT. Uh, if you stop and think about that, uh, we had a comparative advantage of having a very large manpower resource uh, with the right kind of qualifications to make a big uh, change and a big impact on the global scene. And then on top of this comparative advantage, then you build several competitive advantages the, through innovations and so on. Which is why 
IT made uh, such a huge impact, both globally and uh, for India. So if I take the same kind of a model and then say, what are the comparative advantages that South has on which we can hopefully look at uh, some building some competitive advantage, uh, I would think service rather than even manufacturing should continue to be the focus. Uh, in the future, the next uh, decade or two, service will have even a higher proportion of growth than manufacturing. Indeed, manufacturing is going through the, you know, 4.0 and uh, most of manufacturing is going to be really service. And uh, the, we're going to be talking about digitalization, uh, more of robotization, uh, more of IoT, a lot of that is uh, service. And uh, South is already becoming uh, a big hub for uh, SaaS. Yeah. It's becoming a big hub for uh, tech startups. So I don't see why that should not be the engine of uh, growth. So you play to your competitive advantage of having, again, skilled demand power, people who have had this experience of having built businesses in this area, uh, and then to scale up and become uh, global. Uh, similarly, you also have food processing. I mean, if agriculture is a very strong uh, um, comparative advantage that the South has. So whether it's spices from Kerala or, uh, or from uh, Andhra, uh, there's plenty that can be and should be done in order to make that into a, a global impactful kind of uh, engine. Uh, the third is, I think uh, it is important to really be clear about uh, whether we are talking about uh, self-reliance towards this route uh, or through an open uh, economy. Uh, I can't think of one country that has uh, looked at self-reliance as the way to move to a, to a globally competitive economy. Uh, I'm told that self-reliance is competitiveness, which is a good thing, and that it's not self-reliance alone, it is competitiveness. And if that is so, then I think it's important that we look at uh, where we can collaborate uh, with the right kind of partners in, in the chosen areas in order to become globally impactful. Yeah. And three things are very quickly needed for that. One is uh, certain protection uh, of the local industry for a certain period of time. Uh, and the more importantly, the neutralization of the cost disadvantage that we have through the PLI and so on. Lastly, enterprise. We need entrepreneurs. That's the critical thing. Right. Mr. Santana? Yeah. I think if uh, India has to become a 5 trillion, as uh, she said, whenever it happens, South has to be significantly more than its 25%. I, I believe that if this is going to happen, and manufacturing, and I'm including construction uh, and buildings in that, is 25%, that has to become something like 35%. South starts with a huge advantage in all of that. If this 35% has to go to 40 or 45% in India, I'm including manufacturing plus construction, then I think South has to lead the way. And uh, I think what is today, I would say, is a little bit lacking in, in the South, uh, whether it's businesses, whether it's government, is really aspiration to go way beyond what we are today. I think the first and the foremost thing that I would say is, is aspiration. And I really believe that South has an incredible infrastructure of large companies, uh, uh, mercifully, we don't have too many public sectors, so we don't have that problem. But we have large private sectors, large multinationals, and a very large ecosystem of MSMEs. Any country in the world does not have a very shallow uh, foundation of large number of MSMEs and a few uh, big, uh, big companies. So we really need to get these MSMEs to aspire. If today they are at 50, crores, can we get them to imagine at 500 crore? I think this is something which is very, very important. And the governments can do whatever it can do, which is, uh, I think, talked already about that infrastructure. But really, we have to get this aspiration in our, uh, in our MSMEs to grow way beyond. And I'm beginning to see that. In fact, recently we had, Sesh was also there, I think we had a meeting with the finance minister and uh, there was not one person who talked about the fact that in the last year the economy is down by minus 8% or they lost businesses by 25% in the first quarter. Almost everyone was saying that the global value chains are coming towards us. And the global value chains mean a lot in manufacturing. 
So I think we have to grab this and South has every advantage. Whatever be the sector that South is, today it's strong. Be it in textile, be it in pharma, be it in the IT, be it in the digitalization services, be it in automotive. South yeah. has a leading position in many of this. And there is an inbuilt competitiveness that large southern enterprises have. And I think that can be leveraged. I think digital is making a huge difference. During COVID, we all realized that we could increase our productivity by 20%. And I can tell you that it's right across industries, right across the spectrum of medium, large, small, people are improving the productivity by 20%. You know what that has made to a company like us, uh, we, we represent a large multinational old company. We believe that today the internal rate of return that we can get from India is much higher. So we are saying that we must target much more investments in India because it has become much more productive. So sure. you see a virtuous cycle of productivity driven by digital which is happening in manufacturing and I think it's beginning to happen in construction and uh, other industries where you see off-site manufacturing, there is a lot of tech which is coming into buildings today. I think the third one is innovation. Innovation is something which is being accelerated. South has huge advantages. If you say the top 50 uh, good academic institutions or research institutions, they're all located in India in the South. You have a fantastic ecosystem of uh, IITs, IIC, large successful private sector engineering colleges working very closely. And I'll give a very, very small example. I mean, today we had that nice news that uh, Bharat Biotech got the emergency authorization for co-vaccine. Where are they from? Uh, Suchitra is from Neiveli, a tier three or a tier four town. And uh, Krishna is from Tirutani, a tier 4 or a tier 5 town. Right. And there are hundreds and thousands of Krishnas and Suchitras in the south. Right. I think it's what, what we need to create that aspiration to have a global play. And that's really what is critical for south. I think by nature, the southern people, all of us are very conservative. We don't talk too much about it. So that's really, for me, aspire, digitalize, and innovate okay. furiously. So aspiration, all right. Mr. Kamar, two, three things that you think are very critical for. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a great uh, honor and pride. Uh, in addition to what my co-panelists have told, South India, for me, it stands out absolutely away from the rest of the country in most of the things. And we have... Uh, 27 factories in 17 locations, so, uh, and I have traveled all the districts in the country in my business. So to that extent, uh, it stands out. One, uh, as, uh, the quality of productivity, what we get here is amazing. And uh, infrastructure, unthinkable. I can just give you a number, between Bangalore and Mangalore, pre-COVID, there were 600 buses flying in the night itself. It cannot happen anywhere in the world. Uh, between Bangalore and Mangalore, night buses, 600. Between Bangalore and Hyderabad, night buses 400. Bangalore and Chennai, it's about 600 per night, every night, and seats are booked. And who are all traveling? They're all the kids. Who are the traveling for job, coming back, going home, coming back, going home. And it's, it's thriving. Uh, so what South India gets is the best of the education, high tech, and uh, access to the Middle East and uh, North Africa and US uh, for, through IT and from Kerala and access to the East, uh, you know, like Singapore, Malaysia, and Vietnam. And what we lack is using our 2,000 kilometers of coastline. Just imagine a situation that South India start producing for India, which is anyway we are doing it. In addition to that, imagine a situation we start catering to Middle East and North Africa, that's about 56 crore of population, and to the ASEAN countries, that's on the 60 crore population. In the past, productivity was an, was an issue, but that generation is gone now. The new generation productivity is at par. What you get in the East, it can be produced in South India. There's no doubts in my mind, uh, because machineries are available, trainings are available, and uh, to become vital in economy, I mean, we are on the right track, uh, as uh, 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 Mr. Seshisai said, what, when it will happen, whether 25 or 26, it will happen for sure, and South has a great contribution, and uh, 
It's fun fundamentally, it comes down to only four factors. Land, it's very expensive in India, uh, especially in South, it's more expensive. Labor, we need to manage the productivity. And the cost of capital has to be subsidized for productivity or production. And end of the day, entrepreneurship, we are seeing the startup India in Bangalore now, how it has in entirety changed the scheme of things uh, as uh, you know, like uh, Silicon Valley of the country. So to that extent, uh, I'm very, very hopeful and uh, optimistic that South India will be the driving engine uh, towards the uh, fight and economy. Okay, the, the key pillar of this uh, strategy of self-reliance is the productivity linked scheme, you know, PLI. And uh, so, can we try and understand what really is the, uh, you know, how is it changing the investment climate, if at all? And then, if we can also look at what is the, uh, the flip side of that? There is a huge flip side. It's a double-edged sword in some ways because it also raise, in, increases, uh, raises import duties and then eventually leads to higher cost of, uh, you know, production for the domestic industry. So, uh, what is the right balance in PLI and uh, whether it is actually changing the investment climate and then the flip side, Dr. Reddy. So, I think to begin with, uh, the aspiration of boosting up the contribution of the manufacturing sector uh, to the overall GDP from the current about 14 to 17 percent uh, to 20 to 25 percent is the basis for finding schemes to remove the lack of competitiveness. And like Ulas rightly said, uh, there's a land issue, but significantly also it's the ease of doing business, it's the cost of power, and also it's the logistics. Globally, logistics costs are under 10 percent. It's 8, 9, 10 percent. In India, it's upward of 14 percent. So while it will take us time to solve these problems, whether it's electricity, there's potentially a new electricity act coming into parliament, logistics, there are clusters of manufacturing, there are new highways. But if you want a solution now, the PLI was the offset to say that India can be as competitive as Bangladesh, as Taiwan, so don't go there, come to India. So as a scheme, as a concept, it is perfect. Now is to convey that concept and to focus on execution. I think the stars are aligned and it's time for us to just pick up the mantle and make it happen. Well, I think uh, the important uh, uh, part about any such scheme that gives a subsidy is to put a sunset clause make sure that there is a very definite date of exit so that there is enough pressure on the business to compete on their own without the crutches being provided by the government. Uh, but at the same time, the initial years, it is important that that kind of cost neutralization uh, is made available to the business to stand up and start. It's like, it's like providing um, uh, nourishment to a baby uh, you have to do that in order to get the baby to stand on its own legs. It is important to do that for a certain limited period of time. Uh, you refer to the cost of logistics and power. Uh, Indian business pays uh, something close to 20 cents per unit of power. And the most competitive uh, benchmark for power is about 6 to 7 cents. And therefore, unless you are in a position to make that happen here within a limited period of time, you cannot really become competitive. The second point about this is that I think the PLI scheme would probably do much better if it is awarded to industries which are located in a particular zone where there is sustained availability of competitive infrastructure uh, at the right cost. Uh, so I would think that if uh, you have a, call it by any name, National Manufacturing Zone or the uh, much maligned uh, SEZ or whatever, if you can get com companies and industries to come together in a cluster, in a place where there is competitive global uh, uh, infrastructure made available to them, given a period of time which PLI is available and later on if they have to compete on their own, then that's a sustainable kind of a process. Okay. So Dr. Reddy, you want to yeah, come back? Very quickly. quickly, I just want to add to Shesh's point is that, you know, last year uh, with FIKI, we worked exactly on this point and I think there are 11 different parks which are already announced and many more in the offing. Uh, the other important aspect in this entire thing of competitiveness is ease of doing business. 
So procedurally, we have to remove some of the non-productive uh, kind of paperwork. So a concept of a single portal where you enter all compliance issues and that central portal then conveys to all the multiple government agencies is the second important one because I think it's important for us to get more productive. And the third critical one which is linked to the PLI and to India's manufacturing trajectory is for us to think scale. Because when we think scale, then we produce high quality as well as lower cost. And to do scale, you make in India for the world, for India and for the world. So these, these are three quick things I wanted to add. Mr. Santana? Yeah. So uh, in general, I'm in uh, favor of this PLI. And I, I get a feeling that it's being done well. Just to tell you that we had the SCZ in Chennai, which attracted a lot of electronic industries in the 2007 to 2011, including Nokia, which closed down for several reasons, uh, a lot of it due to business reasons. But if you go there today, you have something like 100,000 people re-employed thanks to this PLI. And you see Sri City, you go there, you have Foxconn between Sri City and Chennai, has got something like 80,000, 100,000 people, and they're employing something like 50 or 60,000 women, and all moving from agriculture to uh, factory jobs. So I genuinely believe that industries need some kind of a support to overcome the structural disadvantages that we have. We still have high energy costs, be it power or fuel or gas. We still don't have GST for uh, oil. So those things have to be corrected. Till such time as those are corrected, these champion sectors and the PLI that the government is being talked about is relevant. Globally, I think economists are changing their opinion. I think for 204 years, we've had David Ricardo rule over Roos saying, uh, law of comparative advantage. But in a digital world with nationalism, with uh, emotional issues coming in the way, I think this David Ricardo's comparative advantage has to be revisited. I have a feeling a little bit of self-reliance is useful. And today, a lot of the famous auto sectors that we have in Tamil Nadu or to some extent the IT sectors, all of them came at a p point where we had a little bit of protection and the IT sectors came where the government gave the ST, STPA benefits. So I believe that if this is handled well and if this is targeted well and if the state governments and the central governments work this well, this can be a great advantage because we are seeing it. When, we, when I look at for investment, we look at whether we have to do it in India or in ASEAN. Okay? With a free trade with ASEAN and with some of the factor costs in ASEAN, India will never make the cut for any investments. But if there is a PLI and if you find that there is a benefit coming in and if you're one of the champion sectors identified, it makes a very big difference. Will it make a difference after 10 years? I don't know. So the key thing is we have to have a lot of limitations on some of this. But at the same time, without that kind of a support to believe that your child has to go learn to run and uh, do marathon, it's not going to happen. So I think this BLI is going in the right direction. The champion sector's approach is going in the right direction. So I do hope that this continues and it is targeted well. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Kamath, do you also think that uh, there is no uh, there's no flip side to it. It's not a double-edged sword. Uh, no, I think it's a, it's it's the right thing to do for with the PLI, and uh, I completely agree that uh, it has to be time-bound, maybe for five years or ten years, uh, so that people prepare accordingly. Uh, it cannot be a benefit forever. Uh, we have seen that in 1991 liberalization, uh, when the excess duty was uh, exempted uh, from a uh, few states, a backward uh, district, everybody went there. And if you see the Northeast, because of the government support, entire Northeast is thrived because of the excise and income tax benefit what government has given. But everything was time bound, everything is now on sunset clause. To that extent, the PLI, if it is defined very nicely, probably uh, with a time bound program, uh, all of us we can plan. The second one is that if you want to have a global competitive advantage, uh, if you want to be in manufacturing, uh, naturally it should be a partnership between the government and the industry, unless that is done. For example, if you have a certain business plan now with the kind of diesel prices what we have, how do you move the trucks? The entire cost of production will change. And how can it be competitive? So to that extent, some of the decisions what the government is taking, uh, we should be aware that you know some of these are pre 
bed quotes what people have had to export at that price and they cannot be losing because of the transportation cost here. So to that extent, there should be a partnership kind of a thing between uh, the, uh, the government and the private sector. There is, there is a very intense uh, investment competition emerging between uh, states now. And uh, it, it is sometimes becoming uh, very uh, extremely competitive and to some extent self-destructive. So where does the uh, healthy competition end and self-destruction start when it comes to uh, wooing businesses, Dr. Reddy? So I think right now there is adequate scope for growth in all areas. And there is, thankfully, enough global capital and enough capital looking to come into India. So we haven't reached that point. Uh, every state is coming up with their industrial policy, with a strategy to really uh, attract. I think there's a great uh, potential in sitting together and choosing areas and minimizing overlap. For example, Telangana did something very smart in that they built on our, their strengths, which is the pharmaceutical, and are now doing a much larger pharmaceutical park. They looked for new emerging areas. So IT is kind of, everybody needs to do IT, but they also found IT-enabled specializations and then did a very significant thing in defense. So if each one could find their specialized clusters, minimize the extent of extreme competition and also figure out where to draw the line on this one. But for now, I think that's, uh, right now it's about scope and scale and winning the kind of global opportunities that we have. So uh, the, the point of what you're making right now of disruptive competition is probably a few years away. Okay, Mr. Sashasai, would you agree? Uh, broadly, yes, but I think uh, the most important thing about making promises of uh, concessions, tax concessions to attract investment, yes. is to make promises that you can keep. One of the big problems, and I'm not specifying a state for that, one of the big problems is that uh, the promised concessions are not made available. That, I think, is, is pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there is an affordability check that is critical. And therefore, the state has to be responsible for the promises they make in terms of the concessions. That's number one. Number two is theoretically. I mean, you don't uh, make uh, uh, concessions available beyond what you believe is the right cost of creating a job. At the end of it, it's about direct and indirect jobs. And therefore, I'm not sure that there is a template that uh, state governments uh, use for the purpose of assessing what's the cost of uh, the grant that, is, that, that goes to create a job, I think it's important to have uh, some kind of a national benchmarks on this and subject the concessions to that benchmark to see whether it is really making sense uh, at, the, at the ground level to create jobs. And a quick line, I think all of us in India should realize that our competition is not internal. Right. It's Bangladesh where textile is rocking, it's Taiwan where, uh, you know, the, the entire electronic industry, yeah. it's uh, Bangkok. Imagine that Thailand is doing more on furniture than India. Yeah. So let's figure out where our true competition is and ensure that we as a country compete collaboratively. Right. Mr. Santana? Yeah, so I'll speak from a microeconomic point of view. I'm not going to speak for the state, so I think... Uh, both Sangeeta and Shesh are eminently qualified for that. From a firm point of view, I love this competitive, competitiveness amongst the state. I think all of us, when we go for our firm, we want the best possible thing. And I believe that the states have figured this out. I think there is a shift. In the past, states used to give away the future revenues, uh, future tax. I think states have shifted to a, a, a very classical model of an investment subsidy. Today, Anywhere in the world you go, there is a classical investment subsidy, whether it's in New York or whether it's in uh, Hungary, whether it's in France, whether it's in Germany, whether it's in Vietnam. There is an investment-related subsidy which is always provided. That's a better model because you are very clear about the investment, whereas you don't know how long, what is the multiplying factor for the revenues. So I'm for intensely states competing amongst themselves. And they will figure this out over a period of time. They, will, they have enough avenues for them to talk to each other and figure out uh, what they're doing is leading to 
uh, you know, a, a downward path or not. But I think for the, uh, uh, probably for a few years, if not a decade, we should let that play. Because if we want free market, why can't we allow the states to have a free market on attracting the firms within the uh, overall uh, boundaries? And so that's, that's really my view. But my view is a uh, firm's eye view and not necessarily a view okay. from the state. Okay. Mr. Kamath? Uh, the competitive advantage, what we have now, by and large, we see the South and the non-South. It is uh, definitely in favor of South, number one. Number two, anything with the investment subsidy, uh, if you are coming in on a long-term basis, the state should have the ability uh, to honor the commitments. Uh, and uh, with this uh, new ease of doing business competition amongst the state, now we are able to see a lot of improvement. And states are fighting for investment. States are fighting for creating new jobs and uh, inviting uh, best of the best companies into their states. That's the uh, uh, trend which we are seeing in the last uh, five or six years. That's a very good position to be in. Uh, each state, you can take it as a country, they have everything is going right for them. And uh, uh, certain things which we have plenty when compared to non-south is uh, infrastructure, uh, whether it's uh, airlines, or, I mean airports or uh, railways or uh, anything you talk we have in South India. And every state, fortunately we have at least four good airports. Uh, anybody can connect to any cities and you know, go and come back. Uh, this if you are able to make use for ourselves for the domestic consumption, but the big portion of the production has to go uh, for the world, and which is, I still believe that Middle East and North Africa and the ASEAN countries could be a destination. Just to add one more point, entire Jebelali was built uh, based on uh, this theme in the past. People yeah. used to send raw material from India, get it finished goods there, and send it to the world. And the value addition was there, kept as tax-free income. Right. Uh, and the same thing can be shifted back to uh, South India at any point in time. Uh, model is the same. Uh, so uh, my recommendation or my, my, my humble submission is that we should look South India as a, a make in India and made for the world destination. Okay. If you had to choose uh, the top two states on ease of doing business, what would they be? Dr. Reddy. So the top two states on ease of doing business? I think I should view. let people who are working in multiple states answer that one. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we have uh, in Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Kerala, a little bit in Andhra Pradesh, in Rajasthan, Gujarat and Maharashtra. Uh, we haven't really found uh, a big problem in running uh, large operations in many of these states. I think you have to be very clear about your principles. Uh, what you do right and what you will never do. Uh, I personally believe that uh, when I look at the overall nature of people availability, talent availability for advanced uh, manufacturing industries like the one that I uh, represent, uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, Maharashtra and uh, Gujarat come quite, quite good. I mean, when you talk about ease of doing business, I don't think we have a serious concern about how we go about doing a business as not too many things are coming in our way. So I would say that Tamil Nadu, Tamil Maharashtra, Maharashtra, Gujarat, yeah. Dr. Reddy, your choice? So Top I two. think I, I, would, I would tend to agree. Of course, uh, I would say that Andhra Telangana also are emerging as, uh, from the point of view of attractiveness as a destination, whether it's the real estate cost or the quality of people uh, available, attractiveness of a destination combines this aspect. So I would add those two into the mix. I think there's great potential in the Northeast and we need to look, as a country, we need to look at that zone. Uh, I believe that in terms of just low cost, hard working labor, UP, Maharashtra, Bhuvneshwar, there are people available. And while we're you know, moving them to different states, this may not be so easily possible. So are we going to come to terms with the new emerging uh, states in the north? And I know this is a south conference, but I'm thinking India. Okay. Dr. Mr. Sishisai. You know, uh, I'm an ancient guy, and I've heard about this single window clearance for about 30 years. <laughs> um, I think uh, the Indian industry has figured out, um, despite the discomforts that you have, the non-ease of doing business, we've figured out all the answers. I think the key thing is really to look at uh, what is the, the, the situation with regard to people who are entering this country from outside of India. 
uh, where would they go and pitch their tent? And that I think is a key question. And to answer the question, you must go back and look at the index uh, of ease of doing business and say, where are the pain points? The pain points are not so much uh, relating to a particular problem, relating to a particular state. It's, for example, the, uh, the, the speed of judicial uh, uh, decisions. Uh, these are not uh, state level issues. These are much larger level uh, yeah. issues. Yeah. Environmental clearance is not something which is a state level issue. It is a national level issue. Okay. So I think there are situations where we have to tackle at a national level in order to make ourselves a more attractive destination. I'm not sure that I have ever been in, uh, in discussions outside this country amongst investors where people have said, uh, you know, Telangana or uh, Tamil Nadu is a great state to go without discussing India. Sure. It's India and then you make a choice. Okay. There are barriers to be crossed while coming to this country. Right. And that I think are the key issues. Okay. Mr. Kamat, top two states. And, and in that context, states who already have a high propensity for investment from global markets, like Japan. When I met the ambassador of Japan, he clearly said, we're very happy with Tamil Nadu, we're going to do more in Tamil Nadu. Okay. So there's an advantage already in the South. Okay. Mr. Kamar? Yeah, for me, it's Karnataka and Telangana, undoubtedly. Uh, and uh, ease of doing business, uh, uh, it based on the investment what you make. Uh, suppose if you're making 100 crore of investment in a state, you get the access of whatever the things you want. You get a red carpet welcome. But my worry always been uh, with the small MSMEs, uh, how, do, how do they find the seed of do, doing business? So to that extent, long way to go. And uh, single window system uh, has to be digitized completely so that you put it at one place, everything should be falling in place. Uh, but uh, every government is working very fast. Uh, absolutely, uh, the speed in which they are working makes us to believe that we are here to transform everything in the years to come. Very optimistic. Okay, we have almost run out of time, but I wanted to uh, take one minute, if you can take each to tell us, uh, can South replicate the success of Bangalore? Is there a Bangalore happening already or about to happen? in any other part of uh, South India, very quickly, Dr. Reddy. So absolutely, I think it's, it's happening in Telangana. It's happening in other small towns. And Which clusters. industries in Telangana? So in the IT sector, clearly, Hyderabad is growing as a favored sure. destination yeah. and it's something that we can be proud of and look forward to. But I want to use my one minute to really slightly flip the whole equation and say why it's very important for us to achieve this five billion. It's not for the five billion sake. It's of course for the potential and the opportunity, but it's primarily because 17 million young people are coming into the workforce every single year. We have to find jobs for them. This is an India national agenda. And therefore, the South can play a major role in that. And I think that's the reason that we innovate, we find global products, we manufacture, we do food, uh, we hasten the execution of the national infrastructure pipeline, we find healthcare. All these need to happen for the sake of those 17 million jobs. Right. Mr. Seshasai? I hear you asking this question. Um, the way that uh, service IT services have flourished and have made a global impact from out of Bangalore. Can we do something else? Uh, to me, uh, that foundation that we have, the IT services itself is a good enough thing to build on. And uh, as I said a little while ago, that uh, this is, uh, South is becoming a SaaS capital. You've got a phenomenal amount of opportunities coming in the area for, of uh, uh, remote uh, uh, healthcare facilities. You have uh, phenomenal opportunities coming in teaching, in distance uh, learning. You've got phenomenal opportunities in healthcare itself. So I think there are several things that you can do, build on top of what you already have using the digital advantage that we have. Okay. Mr. Santana? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, but I'll confine myself to the 35% uh, uh, which is manufacturing and building and construction and infrastructure. I think South has huge advantages which it can leverage. I think whether it's in the automotive, whether it's in the process chemical industries or whether it is in textiles or pharma, or in every single thing, South has critical mass of companies, industries, who are great but who are also innovating heavily. And I think it's, it's very natural that South must take this and it's going to ha it has happened in the 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s in manufacturing. 
But in, in the 80s and 90s, South led the way in IT. But I think that you will find the manufacturing and associated services uh, connected could really, uh, South could do exactly what was seen as having been done in the IT. And it's, it's just a question of time. Mr. Kamath, is there a Bangalore happening anywhere in South? Uh, absolutely. I think the next best thing can happen to us is in health tech, edu tech, and uh, uh, the startup community. And uh, what, it, what we have now, 43 unicorns, if we can make it 100 uh, unicorns in the next uh, four or five years, th that will be the game changer for the entire South India. And today, because of this COVID and work from home, the uh, tier two, three, three cities have started already operating uh, and they will not come back to the cities. To that extent, uh, all the four, five states, you will see enormous uh, growth happening in uh, startup community. Okay, with that, we've run out of time. I, uh, may I wish you all the best in being uh, possibly the force behind this, uh, uh, this challenge of uh, hitting the trillion dollar mark or maybe multi-trillion dollar mark for, uh, for South uh, in, the, in, in India's journey towards five trillion. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reddy. Thank you, Mr. Seshasai. Thank you, Mr. Santanam and uh, Mr. Kamath. Thanks for your time. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.